Go! <laughs> <laughs> If you love relentless movies, look no further. If you don't, keep watching. I might just change your mind. The Safdie brothers have a way of making you feel uncomfortable. Hey. You want fucking tea in your eyes? Anxious. Wow. That's great, Howard. Howard. And overwhelmed. What the f Their approach to filmmaking is a combination of relentless chaos Shit. and meticulous planning. Plus, this intangible quality that makes their work immediately recognizable. This is point A, this is point B, he said. It goes like this, and he like did all these crazy lines. He said, as long as you have one line that goes from point A all the way to point B, we're okay, you're fine. Today, we're gonna talk about the elaborate design, the DNA that makes a Safdie Brothers movie tick. And to do that, let's go back to the beginning. No, 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 no. The very beginning. Josh and Benny were born and raised in New York, living between their mother Amy in Manhattan and their father Alberto in Queens. By the age of eight and 10 years old, the two already had a camera in their hands and film on their mind, thanks to their father who used movies to express what his words couldn't. He famously sat the brothers down in front of Kramer versus Kramer when they were children to tell them that he and their mother were divorcing. I've taken $2,000 out of our savings account because that's what I had in the bank when we first got married. Was this some kind of joke? Can we stop now? Hell of a communicator. Through their tumultuous childhood, one thing that stuck was this love for film. The two would candidly record mundane conversations or create fake documentaries, which you could coin as the inception of their hyper-realistic style. For some reason, Benny and I, we get the first stuff that we did was fake documentaries. We just were like always coming up, we were trying to like make something super real. They were obsessed with capturing reality. A little further down the line, the two attended Boston University and co-founded Red Bucket Films, which was a creative collective that produced a host of shorts, advertisements, pranks, and experimental films. I've added a link above and below to all their work there, and I really suggest The Black Balloon. Seriously, it's great. During their time at Red Bucket Films, the two also befriended the Neistat brothers. Yeah, those Neistat brothers. That friendship led Casey to produce Daddy Long Legs, their first feature-length film. Let's fast forward another six years, and there I was, age 23, completely awestruck by the grit of heaven knows what. The spiraling, heroin-fueled drama immediately drew me in through its visual style and its stark portrayal of addiction. And then it sank its teeth deeper as I discovered just how tied it was to real experiences, pulling from Ariel Holmes' own memoir as a homeless drug user. Yeah, I started to ask her to write about her life, write about what happened in one day, I don't care if you did nothing all day, I want you to write about what that nothing looked like. And although this might be the most realistic of the Safdie Brother movies, all of their films draw from real events, real people, and their own experiences to elevate their authenticity. Daddy Long Legs, autobiographical. Heaven Knows What, biographical. Good Time, kind of biographical. The film itself is inspired by real events in Buddy Duress's prison memoir. And even Uncut Gems is loosely drawn from their father's experience as a diamond runner on 49th Street. For Josh and Benny, one thing's clear. Drawing from reality is a necessity, and it's been consistent in all of their work. Even when they're not shooting, they're shooting. They always seem to have a camera rolling, recording moments to serve as inspiration for their writing. And this relentless fascination with emulating real life has helped the Safties excel at the storytelling fundamental of writing great characters. Safdie protagonists generally exist in the underbelly of society, towing the line between sanity... What? You're gorgeous. Oh, God. ...and madness. You could not do this in my apartment! All right, fine, fine. Whether it's a criminal making questionable decisions for the sake of his brother, or a compulsive gambler who can't stop doubling down, they're written as honest character studies that motivate their film's narrative. Honestly, the, the personal hack for ourselves has always been, if you know your characters, the narrative writes itself. This character-driven approach doesn't stop with their protagonists. As you may have heard, the Safdie brothers are notorious for casting non-actors and first-time actors in their movies. 
Some of their breakout first timers include Ariel Holmes, of course, whom the brothers met on a subway platform, Julia Fox, or even Keith William Richards. I mean, look at that guy, he's made for movies. But did you know that this guy, Eric Pakert from Good Time, is an actual bondsman in Queens? Or that the Greenberg brothers from Uncut Gems are real pawnbrokers on 49th Street? There are dozens of examples in all of the Safdie movies of non-professional actors being used. So why use someone who's never acted? The answer is probably obvious, because using real people brings that intangible authenticity to the characters they play. On top of this, the Safdies approach writing and directing collaboratively. Josh has mentioned previously that the script is a means, not an end, so we look to the script for guidance, not for rule. These non-actors often inspire, mold, and tweak their characters' behaviors with their own experiences. Yes. Some love, what's up? It's part of the reason the Safdies write and write and write and write. I mean, Uncut Gems had over 160 rewrites before arriving at its final version, which is a testament to their craft. And once their stories are ready, boy do they hit the ground running. Let's talk about how they typically kick off their movies. Benny has said that, We kind of despise exposition. We're never really that interested in it when it's being spoon-fed to you. It's like if you see someone interesting on the street, you have to fill in the blanks, and that process of filling in the blanks is so exciting. Starting a film with no exposition is called media res, which is Latin for in the middle of things, and it forces the audience to pay attention. It isn't too unconventional, but seeing as they begin all of their films like this, it's really become part of their style. It's a narrative choice that fits their subject matter. To make media res work, you have to be meticulous in how you present action, because you're trusting the audience to deduce the context rather than explaining it through dialogue. It's a gamble, but if it works, it pays off. Let's see how this looks in good time, while paying particular attention to the pacing and the composition. We open with an establishing shot of the city, before cutting to an extreme close-up of Nick that slowly zooms out. The audience first discovers Nick's character and then his environment, which means the relationship that's established with him is empathetic. The dialogue follows suit. Now, the pace isn't necessarily slow as the psychiatry session unfolds, but it's controlled. The camera's static. The Safdies only use three shots here with varying levels of zoom. You have Nick's close-up, Dr. Peter's close-up, and the shot of the notepad. This level of consistency grounds the office as a safe and stable place. As the scene unfolds, you'll notice that the shot reverse shots are closer to Nick than Dr. Peter, which furthers our emotional connection to him. We're emotionally closer because we're physically closer, and that makes the single tear that runs down his cheek that much more powerful. And right as the session nears a breakthrough, we should talk about this. Uh, this is good stuff. We're catapulted into Connie's world. Excuse me, you Peter? Yes, I am. We're in the middle of. Si a lot of things happen here. The camera switches to handheld. Voices layer on top of each other, and Nick loses total control. Hello, Nick. What, what are you doing? The previous three-shot consistency goes out the window as Connie's character is introduced. How would you like it if I made you cry? How would you like that? As the scene unfolds, we're locked into shaky handheld close-ups, which engulf us with the emotional state of its characters and establish context as to Connie and Nick's relationship. It's just you and me. I'm your friend, right? Within the opening minutes of the film, the entire narrative is set up, leaving nothing for interpretation. Now that's how you start a movie. With the Safdie brothers, the narrative style fits the subject matter. Starting their films with more traditional exposition would dull their emotional impact and clash with the craft. It's the synchronicity between the action taking place and how it's captured on film that makes Safdie narratives so unique. And speaking of how things are captured, there's one thing we haven't spoken about yet. Um. What is it, barbecue chicken? No. We're talking about camera lenses. Yeah! Yeah! <laughs> oh my god! It's undeniable that the Safdie brothers have a unique visual identity, and I don't think it requires a keen eye to be noticed. For me, it boils down to the use of handheld shots and the use of long lens shots. Filming in handheld gives the audience a sense of immediacy and subjectivity by being part of the action it captures. Get a glass! Get a glass! It makes what's happening on screen up close and personal, often trailing right behind the action taking place. Fuck. It's Listen, I got a case. On the other hand, filming with long lenses gives the audience a sense of distance and surveillance. It allows for contrast to be made between the subject of a frame and the foreground and background. 
The emotional effect is similar to how we feel when watching documentaries. Moments captured in long lens feel like glimpses into another world that we get to observe from a distance. Juggling these two techniques allows the safties to draw us in and out of action without losing any sense of realism. They can throw us into chaos without warning, or make us feel like watchers peering into the unknown. And the safety style doesn't compete with their characters, but rather it allows them to be fully realized. One of my favorite examples of this is how, for heaven knows what, the safties intentionally chose to not shoot handheld. Like, with this subject matter, it would have made sense to shoot it handheld. You know, you're shooting the street, you're shooting the nitty gritty, but that's what we didn't want to do. We were kind of going in the opposite direction. How we made our lives so much harder by doing this. Observing from afar means we endure New York City's organic chaos alongside its characters, which does more to capture the themes of the film than any character could have done when shooting handheld. And in all of their movies, short films, music videos, the visual commotion dials up to 11, leading to reviews like Good Time grabs the viewer by the back of the hair and drags us along, or Uncut Gems is a two-hour heart attack. The experience isn't accidental, it's by design. Holy shit, I'm gonna come. So at this point in the video, you might be thinking, damn, a lot of what the Safdie brothers do kind of sounds like they just want to create these gritty, hyper-realistic movies. I mean, cool, yeah, but that's not so special. And I'd have to say, I disagree. See, the secret ingredient of each Safdie movie is a pinch of surrealism. That's funny! These moments break the gritty consistency of their films and allow us to admire and really take in the spectacle of what's unfolding. In Good Time, the vibrant lighting transforms a rundown apartment into a manifestation of Connie's inner state, vacillating between these composed blues and seductive reds and pinks. Heaven Knows What does something similar with neon pinks when Harley gets high, visualizing her mind's many addictions. And you also have the more obvious examples, like the giant mosquito that invades Lenny's reality in Daddy Longlegs, which helps us empathize with his incomprehension of the world around him. These surreal moments are meaningful and hypnotic. They help the audience make sense of the chaos, that stranger-than-fiction narrative that's unfolding, not to mention pushing the more skeptical viewers to suspend whatever disbelief they may still be holding onto. The key word here is balance, and it's essential to every safety movie. And when it's achieved, you have an adrenalized, magnetic experience that you just can't look away from. Boom, bang, you're good. You good? Handheld versus long lens, real versus surreal, hero versus villain. Safdie protagonists aren't good people, but they're also not bad people. Their moral ambivalence is much more reflective of the reality they portray. Howard Ratner is a despicable gambler, but also an affectionate father. And Connie's a serial manipulator, but he's motivated by love. The bold equilibrium of a Safdie Brothers movie makes it extraordinary. Despite their subject matters, the pair seek not to cast judgment, but to explore the tangled duality of human nature. Their objective to capture reality through the camera has raised the bar of naturalistic cinema, redefining the genre in itself. And although their style can be overwhelming or uncomfortable at times, I find it to be undeniable. Jean-Luc Godard once said that art is not a reflection of reality, it's the reality of a reflection. And if this is true, the Safdies hold our eyes open to the mirror before us.